play that in more every sermon. You know, find hard not to, you know, run up the stairs and do the rocky thing, you know, with the... <laughs> that is... Uh, uh, good morning to everybody at Mornington. I, di- I didn't hear you. Uh, good morning. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's good to be with you. We've had uh, a remarkable week as a, a church family and, uh, and it really was uh, a special day on Anzac Day. I want to personally thank everybody who was part of it. Uh, there's, there's a cost to putting aside time and also I know for a number of people it's a little scary to step out into the community and, and do something like that, particularly when you don't have a history to, to say, okay, how, how does this work? And, uh, and so uh, for the 60 or so people that were part of the team, it really was a very special day. Uh, Leanne and I just got back. We've uh, 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 about... Uh, Point out, Leanne pointed out it was almost 20 years ago now, we purchased a house in the little village of Poatina. It was our, uh, our family home for a number of years and we, we did, a, did the dash up and back. We, we were hoping to, to sell the house but haven't been able to. Fortunately though, the, the, the bank were able to use that as uh, collateral to, for us to purchase a house here in, in Mornington. Uh, and now we find ourselves in the place of having two houses uh, which is uh, great if, you, if, you, if you're a kind of handy person, that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, but my wife will tell you, I'm, I'm not really uh, a handy kind of person. Uh, but one of the things that it's had me thinking a little uh, as we la- uh, launch into this uh, sermon series, and in particular this, this sermon about ownership and how it works. You see, up in the rafters of our uh, Poetina House. Someone has written, uh, I think, 1964 uh, in white paint on the when you get up into the roof. And uh, it, my kids tell me I'm old, but I, I wasn't actually alive in 1964. What, what's interesting is that house, and, and there's a whole lot of people who are going, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> But anyway, <coughs> and, and uh, again, for everybody who was alive in, in 1964 at Mornington and here, uh, that doesn't mean you're old. It just means, you know, you've had more experience than others. Of us. But, um, but one of the things that it, it struck me, and it, even as we come into our, our house at, at, at Mornington, there have been two other owners before us, and uh, one of the owners before um, the one, the, the, the first owner, actually apparently used to work at a, at a, um, uh, a nursery, uh, which is wonderful and terrible uh, because cause what it means is our garden is full of plants. And when I say full of plants, they, they, like really, I, I, we, we, I, I fired up the chainsaw uh, on this week and uh, managed to lop a, get rid of one tree, but we've got plants and roses everywhere. Uh, and one of the things that's it, really struck me is... The idea of owning a house is a funny kind of idea because uh, there have been three people who have said they've owned our Howrah house and what are they, I know at some point there's going to be someone else who says they own it. Uh, similarly, our house in Poatina, like we say we own it, but you know, there have been people before us who have said they own it and hopefully at some point there'll be someone after us who will also say they own it. I... Um, Who's seen Crocodile Dundee? Uh, seen, seen the movie Crocodile Dundee? Uh, yeah, at Mornington, just wanted to check. Yep, yeah, okay, good. I, good. I can see those hands, it's good. Uh, I can't really. Uh, <laughs> but there's a moment in there where uh, Linda Kozlowski is asking uh, Paul H- Hogan about uh, Aboriginal land rights. And he said, well, it's just a, it's a funny conversation to be having. He says... Uh, Aborigines don't own the land, they belong to it. It's like their mother. See, see the, I'm reading actually the script here. See the, those rocks being standing there for 600 million years, still be there when you and I are gone. So arguing over who owns them is like two fleas arguing over who owns the dog they live on. Uh, one of the things, as we, start, as we continue this discussion about money... One of the things, there there is a blind spot we have when we talk about owning stuff. 
A, a biblical view is that God owns everything. Psalm 24 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. This, a biblical view says personal ownership is actually a myth. Now, it's different than personal responsibility. You see, the biblical understanding is that while God owns, we steward. And that idea was planted right at the very, very start of the Bible where uh, God gives people responsibility. But before we look at that verse, let's, what, what does it mean? What is a steward? A steward is a person who acts as the representative of another person's assets or interests. A steward is a person who acts on behalf of another person. And even for those of us who are still trying to understand how God works uh, and whether we or not we, we understand that we are working on his behalf, uh, all, most sociologists will agree with Edmund Burke who says society is indeed a contract, it's a partnership not only between those who are living but between those who are living, those who are dead and those who are to be born. What's he saying? He's saying that we are, this generation, we are responsible, uh, we are looking after our society and our world for the next generation. And we are building on the work of the previous generation. But this is, while Edmund Burke said this is sociologically true, God makes it clear in Genesis chapter 2 that even before the Bible talks about sin entering the world, there was work to do. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That some, sometimes it feels like work is a product of you know, evil and sin, and, but... No, we are all called to responsibility. And, and the picture God had, that the world is God's, but our task is to look after it. C.S. Lewis said, every faculty you have, your power of thinking or moving, your limbs from moment to moment, is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively, exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. The idea of personal ownership is something that's been really important to capitalism. And it, it's this idea, a fellow called Adam Smith came up with this idea that if everybody acts in their own interest, then somehow what he calls an invisible hand will look after, you know, everybody's interests. But there's some flaws with that, and it's not a biblical worldview. The idea that you own your house, or you own your uh, car, or you own your health, or you own your life, is not actually a biblical idea. You are responsible for all those things. So, at the moment, it is nice, the idea of, like, I, I'm... For Leanne and I, it's, it's a, living in our house in Howrah, it's what we call ownership is really an extra level of responsibility. It means we can choose where to put holes in walls and things or what, what plants to take out. And, and in our society, that's wonderful. But I, I also know I, I am looking after that house for the people that come after me. And similarly, uh, one of the great challenges of parenting is uh, often we talk about our kids... It's not true. Our task is to care for our kids and steward them and help them on their journey. They are God's kids, not our kids. Is that, this is how a biblical understanding works. 
Stewardship is not about the stuff we own. It's about the things that have been entrusted to us that we have power to make decisions about. Stewardship is the things that, about the things that you have been entrusted to you. And so we actually need to think differently than how we often think about how, how all this works. Some of the areas of your life that we often think are ours but are actually gifts that have been entrusted to us are things like our personal abilities. Some of us think that, you know, we are good runners and that's because, you know, that's who we are or we are you know, we've got high IQs because that's who we are and, and we think we own that stuff. Now, that's a gift. Similarly, the Bible makes it very clear, spiritual gifts, that God gives different gifts to different people and it's a gift for the sake of the broader church. It's not who you are. You don't own it. Does that make sense? It's yours to look after. Similarly, uh, your relationships. Think of all the people that matter to you. You're, you don't own them, you don't own the relationships. Your task is to steward those relationships, to care for those people, not to own them. An unhealthy relationship is where somebody believes they own another person. Another area of your life that we tend to think about ownership in is all the stuff of your life. The cars, the toys, the the pictures, the, the ornaments, you know, all the stuff of your life, your bank account. We tend to think of that as that we own that, but we, we don't own that. That's the stuff. We are stewards of that. Similarly, one of the things you will, you will discover if you haven't already discovered this, your health is something that is a gift that won't be there forever. One of the things we know about life is that it has a 100% mortality rate. All of us, at some point, will hit the reality that our bodies will give out and ultimately there'll be this question about what happens after that and, and encourage you to be, as you open yourself to who Jesus is, that doesn't mean our life is over, but it means the physical life and your physical body will give out and life at that point can continue forever with Jesus uh, if you're open to him now. We'll talk more about that as we keep going. So our health is a gift. But also uh, the Bible makes it clear and right there in the garden that your environment, the, the place where you live, the, the world you're in, the, the, the kind of the context in which you do life. Uh, they reckon that one of the signs of your emotional inner health is the horizontal services you come in touch with. Uh, if your desk is messy or your, the, 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 the place of your... Uh, the, 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 for me, it's the, uh, my car and the... the, the you know, the, 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 the foot wells and things in your car and, and uh, uh, that often uh, if, if, if you, the places where, you're, you, uh, that where you come in contact with are messy, often that can tell you a little bit about what's going on uh, with your inner world. Someone else pointed out though, if those places are empty, that's not a good sign either. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a whole other point. Um, so, but you are responsible for your environment. Now, each one of those areas affects the other and when one gets too much or not enough attention, it negatively affects all the others. There are two other areas, though, that we are responsible for but have a particular level of importance because they are also measurements of how we prioritise all the other stuff. And they are time and money. Time and money. We can measure the level of focus on the five areas, those previous five we're talking about, with the sixth and seventh areas we're invited to steward. 
I can have a conversation with you about what you value, which will tell me some things. But if I can sit down with you and look at how you actually spend your time, how you actually spend your money, that will actually tell me what you value. And this is why, uh, down the track, I'm really keen to talk more about how we manage our time. Because it's uh, like, I, I think for all of us, this is why God built a Sabbath into uh, the, the, the regular way we, we are designed to work. At one point, uh, after the French Revolution, they decided to move time to a decimal kind of thing and, and try to uh, get rid of a Sabbath, and people were burning out. We are designed to have a Sabbath. And a Sabbath is a very practical... What you're saying with Sabbath is, when I stop, the world doesn't stop. The world doesn't need... God doesn't need me to keep the world going. And it's a, it's a practical demonstration of trust in God. That's what Sabbath is. And so I'd love to talk more about time. And I think as we come to our sermon series on Ecclesiastes in a, in a few weeks' time, we'll spend a bit of time talking about time. But in this sermon series, we're talking about money. And money is an important thing to talk about. But I, I've been conscious coming in. This is, I've only been here seven months at this church. Uh, for those of you who are still getting to know me, and, and I knew coming in that there are a few things you generally avoid to talk about in church, and uh, so I thought we'd better talk about that stuff. Uh, because uh, the stuff that you're meant to avoid, Jesus didn't avoid. Uh, and that's why I think it's important for us to talk about money. And Jesus himself... Uh, uses this idea, of, uh, talks about this idea of stewardship. And there are two stories in particular that he uses. If you've got your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, we won't have all the, uh, the verses come up on the screen for this, so we encourage you to uh, open uh, your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. If you're a, uh, someone who likes technology... Uh, you can open your phones and use the U version app, and on that you'll find all the Bible references and also all the quotes that I use in the sermon. If you go to uh, on the U version app, you go to what it calls events, and then under events, uh, you go to uh, Citywide Baptist Church. We are the only church in Hobart at the moment using it, so we're the only one in on the list. Uh, and so you'll find it there, and you'll find all the quotes and all the Bible references there as well. So uh, Jesus tells two stories in particular, and for the rest of our time, I'm just going to quickly tell these stories and say, okay, what was Jesus trying to say? What was Jesus trying to say to his followers uh, about these stories? The first one, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 he tells a story of a, a rich man who uh, gets his servants together and he's planning, like Vasily, to go on a long trip. The, 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 the man in this story is going on a long trip. Imagine he's going to Romania or somewhere like that uh, on, a, on a plane. And he's got three people who are his servants. And he says, okay, I have things that I need to trust you with. Uh, and he says, I, these three men, I trust this one the most, so I'll give him five. And now, th it depends what translation of the Bible you have as to what it says he gives them. Now, in the more correct translations, it says he actually gives them talents. Because that is, that is the actual Greek word used here, the talent. And the talent is a, a unit of measurement. Uh, and, but modern translations have translated that to bags of gold. Because that is also probably, we're not actually sure what the bags were of, but it's probable that they were bags of gold. And, and, and as they've done the translation, uh, most Bible scholars agree that roughly, as you think about this, one talent would be equal in our money to about $250,000. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. 
So, uh, so when he says, I'm going to give him five talents, anyone good at maths here or at Mornington? Uh, what's five times 250,000? 1.25 million bucks. He's going to say, okay, I'm going to trust you with 1.25 million dollars, he says to the first guy. He then says to the next guy, I'm going to trust you with $500,000. And then to the last guy, I'm going to trust you with $250,000. I want you to look after this resource. And Jesus very clearly saying this as an example to us, you have been entrusted with all these things we've talked about before. You've been entrusted with your health, your relationships. You've been entrusted with the, the money you have in the bank. You've been entrusted with your time. You've been entrusted with your stuff. And that ultimately, the, Jesus is saying, this is how it works. Now, right up front, one of the things that uh, if you hear little kids complain about in the playground is, it's not fair. How come they got more than me? Well, Jesus says in this parable... Yeah, it's right. It's not fair. Uh, everybody's different. God trusts people differently with different things. But one of the things that is clear in this story is that whether... And often we'll think, I want what they've got. Do you ever think that? You know, I want what they've got. Just like little kids in the playground. And, and there's this sense in which that probably the guy that got one talent probably feels a bit that way. What? You know, I want that, what he's got. But we need to understand that whether we see ourselves as having a little or having a lot, Jesus makes it clear, it's all a lot. Like you have been entrusted with a lot. Anybody listening to this story it, it would be going, wow, he gave him a talent? Like it's, it's the same as saying, someone gave you $250,000 to look after? Really? That's what the, the, the story is about. Now, it's also saying we are different and God does give us different things to manage. And uh, there's no point complaining about, you know, I want what they've got. Part of, the, part of the task of being a follower of Jesus is to accept what you've got yourself. So, uh, what happens? Well, the guy that gets five talents goes and invests it and makes another five. The guy that has two talents goes and invests it and makes another two. Do you know what happens to the guy that only gets $250,000? He digs a hole and buries it. And it's interesting, Jesus says uh, to the first two guys, you'll see in verse 21, uh, you have been faithful with a few things. From God's perspective... $1.25 million is nothing. From God's perspective, five talents is nothing. You have been trusted, you've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Almost word for word, he says the same thing to the first two men who produce a 100% profit. They, they invest the gifts that their master had given them. I want to encourage you to, th to bring to your mind what are the gifts that God has actually given you. Often you can be very conscious of what you don't have. But Jesus here is wanting you to be conscious of what you do have. And he wants you to know that's not yours. You are given your life and all the bits of your life for his sake to invest and this man we get to see what's going on in the brain of the, this man who in verse 24 tries to explain to his master why he dug a hole and put the $250,000 in the hole he says in verse 24 master he said I know that you are a hard man harvesting where you've not sown gathering what was gathering where you have not scattered seed, so I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So what, what was wrong? The man had a wrong view of the master. That 
one of the reasons we don't steward well is very clear, fear. Yeah? That's a, that's a nice lollipop you got there, mate. That looks pretty good right now. Um, one of the reasons we don't steward well is fear. We, we're worried about you know, what will happen. And it's interesting, often many of us, they tell us that for many of us, the picture we have of God is of like a, a big parent in the sky waiting to tell us off. And if that is the picture you have of God, it's a wrong picture. And if that is the picture you have of God, no wonder we're afraid. Or even worse, you, for those who don't even know that there is a God, all you, all you believe in is laws that govern the universe and uh, you know that, you know, everything's scary, there's not much to trust if there is no loving God, then no wonder fear will drive your decisions and, and hold you back from making the choices we need to make. We are each given different gifts for which we are responsible. God invites us to build on the gifts with which we've been entrusted. And a wrong view of God and fear about potential outcomes produces a wrong response to the gifts we've been entrusted with. What Jesus makes clear in this is we are accountable to God for the gifts he's given us and we are accountable to steward them. And what is almost counterintuitive about this story is that the more we responsibly carry out our master's affairs, guess what? The more you are trusted. The more you are self-centered, making your decisions about what feels good and how you avoid pain, the less God is able to trust you with. It's kind of a back-to-front kingdom. We, particularly for us Aussies who kind of think, well, the little bloke deserves a go. Uh, well, God says, no, if, if you don't have me, you don't have anything. Jesus says, and this is, I, you'll hear me quote this over and over again, because I think Jesus quotes it over again. It's, it's in every gospel. He says, if you want to seek first your own life, you'll lose your life. But if you are willing to give up your life for my sake, he says. That is the only path to life. There's one other brief story. Well, it's, brief, it's a story that has a lot of people uh, confused because it's not, again, it's a counterintuitive story. This is in the book of Luke, chapter 16. It's the parable of the shrewd manager. Now, actually, in the Greek, that when it says manager, the, the, the word actually means steward. The word actually means steward. Luke chapter 16. And uh, in this story, there was a manager who was accused of wasting his master's stuff. Uh, may, obviously, some kind of corrupt practices of trying to feather his own nest. And so his master calls him to account and says, look, I've heard this stuff, this is true, I don't trust you anymore, I want you to go and work out the accounts so that I can fire you. I want to know what I've actually got left. And the man says, it, you, we actually see what he's thinking, he says, look, I'm not strong enough to be a ditch digger uh, in verse 3, and I'm too ashamed to go and beg for people, so what I'm going to do, I can, I can, the only thing I think of doing is going and winning friends for myself by halving their debts or reducing their debts to my master. So that's what he does. He goes and uh, calls in and his, his masters, the people who owe his master money, and, and says to the first one, so how much do you owe? And the guy says to him, 900 gallons of olive oil. I can't even imagine that. That's but, but about 3,000 litres of olive oil. And he says to him straight away, okay, no worries, halve it. In, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure the guy was happy. Uh, the second guy, he says, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. Again, about uh, 30 tons of wheat. And the guy says, okay, let's make it 800. Um, 
So he, what he's doing is, is reducing the, the money his master is owed. And, and it's almost like you'd be thinking the master would be going, you ratbag, you've just you know, lost me money. But Jesus, the way Jesus tells the story, he says, the master command, commended the dishonest manager because he'd acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. What's he saying? Jesus is challenging us. He says, like, this man knew how to read reality. He knew how to work out what was going on. And, and often, often we Christians can be not so good at reading what's actually going on. Jesus is doing two things at the same time. He is challenging us to learn from, but be different to. He's not saying become this, but he's saying learn from. Some of these people in the world can often read the world better than the church does and be shrewd in the way you engage with the world. And another point, he, he says, you've got to be as wise as serpents but gentle as doves. He, he, you need to be able to read what is actually going on. You need to be, uh, it, it almost sounds sacrilegious because we, don't, we try to avoid this conversation, but we, we need, if you're a Christian, he's saying you need to be politically aware. You need to know all the different agendas going on, driving what's happening, and you need to see behind people's actions to what motivates their actions. Jesus was. Whenever the Pharisees would come and try and trick him, he would be able to speak directly to not what they said the question was, but what the actual question was. We need to be shrewd, as Jesus is saying. But he then says, I tell you, and he says, what's, what's the purpose of your stuff? The, the, of all these things you're responsible, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. He's saying, you are a steward of what God's given to you and the aim of what you are to steward, all your stuff, all your abilities, all your health, is not about what it gets you now. He's saying, the, your purpose is to keep your eyes on eternity and to know the eternal consequences of your decisions. To, and, and as part of all that, he's saying people matter. Now there's debate about whether, because often Jewish people would use these obtuse ways to talk about God and some, people, some commentators think here what they're saying is become friends with God. Uh, others saying, no, become friends with others so that they get to heaven. And others are saying, well, it's just about being able to read reality and respond well. Uh, it probably, I, I think Jesus is smart enough to mean all that. Uh, and, and what he means is, be conscious, your stuff isn't there for you. God has entrusted you with your whole life, all the different belongings, your bank account, your relationships, your health. And your task is to use it with your eyes focused on Jesus for the sake of his kingdom. All of it. There is a, a, a wrong view, and we're going to talk more about this as we continue to talk about money. Even uh, uh, Pastor Dan will do a, uh, finish our time talking about tithing. He says one of, the, one, of the, one of the mistakes that can happen in the church is we think if we tithe, we give God 10%, then we get to keep 90%. That is not a biblical view. It's all God's. But as Pastor Dan will unpack, tithing is just a recognition of his ownership, not, not a, a declaration of, you know, it's not a tax. Does that make sense? So Jesus goes on and uh, he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Again, this back-to-front picture of the kingdom that says, 
Faithful stewardship opens the door to being trusted with more. Faithful stewardship opens the door to being trusted with more. As you open your life to Jesus and his leadership, he'll continue to invite you forward and, and to trust him more and more and the consequences of your life will get more and more significant. It's not an accident that the, the word glory actually means weight. And the more you live your life to glorify God, the more weight your life actually carries. So much so, I love the fact that a, a little nun from Calcutta could stand in front of the, the person who is most to be, meant to be the most powerful person in the universe. Oh, not powerful person, we'll say in the world. The universe is probably overstating it. Uh, uh, but the, the President of the United States. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Mother Teresa stood in front of Bill Clinton and because her life had such weight, because she had lived her life to glorify God, she was able to look him in the eyes and say, abortion is wrong. Stop killing your babies. If you're not going to look after them, give them to me. I'll look after them. And because she had more moral authority than he did, he had to sit there and cope with it, which would have been an uncomfortable moment. But this is how it works. The more you trust God, the more he trusts you and the more weight your life develops. Does that make sense? Then Jesus finishes by saying, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. In verse 13, you cannot serve both God and money. Why, why are we talking about money? Because right at the start of the Bible, with the, the fall we see with uh, Adam and Eve, and right the way through the Bible, the great tension in the Bible is who gets to make the choices? I want to make choices. And if you want to live your life with you at the centre so you can make choices, which is what money represents. Money represents your ability to make choices. If you want to make your choices, you can't follow Jesus. Is what Jesus is saying. It's as simple as that. You can either live your life building your own capacity to make your own choices or you can follow Jesus. Bob Dylan, you know, had it right. When uh, it's a, you know, I'll, I'll just read a couple of the, uh, the, the first verse and, and the chorus where he says, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble, you might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. I'm really tempted to break out into the song, but I'll save you from that. Uh, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And Jesus makes it clear that the great temptation will be to serve money, and through money, serve your own ability to make choices. And in our world, in our capitalist economy, that gets reinforced. You've got to live your life to better serve, you know, be sensible. And you'll hear all kinds of people saying, don't do that. You know, make sensible choices. Sensible is usually code for get enough money behind you before you can then serve God. Uh, now, I, it is not, don't get me wrong, it is not wrong to have money and it's not wrong to actually be sensible. It is wrong, though, to live a life where God is on the margins and your decisions are made by your money. Jesus makes it very clear. So as we wrap up, the, the, the test of stewardship is who is being served by your decisions. The test of stewardship is who is being served by your decisions. 
is God being served by your decisions? Or are you? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of all your personal abilities and your spiritual gifts? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your relationships? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your stuff? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your health? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your environment, all the, the context in which you find yourself? Are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your time, of your calendar? And finally, in terms of this sermon series, are you ready to recognise God's ownership and your stewardship of your money? Jesus makes it fairly clear this is an important question. This is a, a question of whether you are actually a Christian or not. You cannot serve both God and money. And most of us, because we live in a sinful world and we ourselves, like the Apostle Paul says, that, you know, there's part of me that wants to do what's good and Jesus... And, and, Ecclesiastes will talk more about, says there's part of us created in, in the image of God. There's an eternal part of us. There's also a broken, self-centred part of us. And so there are, there are blind spots we have. We don't see our own sin. We don't see the times where we have cut... We don't always see where we've taken shortcuts, where we have organised our lives, not as stewards, but as self-centred Sinners. We'll talk more about it, but ultimately, are you willing to open your normal way of doing things to Jesus' leadership? Are you willing to say with your life, Jesus is Lord? And what that actually means is, are you willing to open your heart to this, to what this means? Are you open to use the Bible as the measure? Are you open, what the Bible makes clear is also, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship one with another. There seems to be a connection with real fellowship and being able to walk in the light. Are you open to, letting, to being open and letting people know what's going on for you and not putting on a religious show? And are you open to start to really engage in prayer? Nothing else we do matters if we're not open to who Jesus is through the Word and through fellowship and particularly through prayer. We've got to become a people of prayer. We've got to be saying, Jesus, what is your heart, what is your will? And step into that together. I'm sorry that this is as confronting as it is. <laughs> Jesus didn't seem to hold back. Ultimately, the question of your life will be, who is Lord? Are you willing for Jesus to actually be the Lord of your life? I pray that we will have the courage to live our lives with Jesus as the Lord, because he says it's the only path to life. Let's pray. So Jesus, as we come, we, we acknowledge that there are plenty of places in our own lives where you're not Lord. There are plenty of places in our own lives where we do things for the sake of comfort, to minimise pain, to maximise pleasure. 
You know that, nothing takes you by surprise, but we also get a sense that you are asking us, inviting us into the fullness of the life that only comes through you. And we, this morning, want to lay at your feet all of the things that we think are ours, all of the things that we think we control. And Jesus, we want to say, you are Lord. We bring you our stuff. We bring you our relationships. We bring you our time, our health. We bring you all the things we think we control. And Jesus, we lay at your feet also our money. Help us have the courage to be led by you and open to the whole story that you call us to, not, the bits, not just the bits that are comfortable. We know we can't do this on our own. Thank you that you're not inviting us to do that. Thank you that you say that you are the way, the truth and the life. Help us respond to you in your heart and by your Holy Spirit be open to the life you have for us. We know we need your help, Jesus. In your name, amen.